Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am delighted to welcome you to this event, Europe at the Crossroads, which is sponsored by the School of International Service and our Transatlantic Policy Center. I would especially like to thank SIS professors Garrett Martin and Michelle Egan, as well as the various embassies for their very hard work in organizing this event and making it possible. Today, we are thrilled to host three ambassadors for this very important discussion. Emily Haber is the German ambassador to the United States, a role she has been in since 2018. Philippe Etienne is the French ambassador to the United States and his career in government has spanned 40 years. And Stavros, Stavros Lambrinidis has been the ambassador of the European Union to the United States since March, 2019. We're so very proud and grateful to have them with us today. Thank you, ambassadors, for being here today. And we very much look forward to learning more from you during this conversation. Aside from the major fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic, the European Union faces significant internal and external challenges, from democratic backsliding to navigating relationships with great powers, such as the United States and China. We're excited to hear from all of you as you discuss these topics and more with our two professors today. Thank you again and do enjoy the event. Garrett, I will pass it on to you now. Thank you very much, Jean Chin. Thank you for all of you who are in attendance look at this event, we're delighted to have you. Before I welcome our three guests, I wanted to give you some quick housekeeping rules here today. First of all, you know, today, you know, we are marking the 70th anniversary of the Schumann Declaration, a rather important seminal moment in the Franco-German partnership and in the process of European integration, a process and a partnership that remains crucial today. This is also an event that's part of the Jean Monnet in the US series, hashtag JM in the US, which is a series of events, a wonderful program organized by all EU funded institutions in the United States. And we're very proud to be part of that program. Now, just in terms of the organization of the event, it will be divided into two sections of 30 minutes. The first section will focus on intra-European affairs, and the second section will focus on transatlantic relations. Now, along with my fellow moderator and fellow director of the Transatlantic Policy Center, Professor Michelle Egan, we will ask some of the early questions, but we are planning to bring the audience in as soon as possible for questions. So we invite all of you to go to the Q&A at the bottom and the middle of the screen. You should see a Q&A. Please line up your questions and we would really be uh, grateful if you could put your name or geographical location or affiliation so that we can have an inclusive list of questions. Now, finally, also a note that this event is being recorded um, on and live streamed on YouTube. So please, no need to record this event. So with that, Housekeeping introduction, I'm delighted to invite our three very distinguished guests, uh, German Ambassador Emily Haber, French Ambassador Philippe Etienne, and the EU Ambassador Stavros Lambrinidis. Well, welcome Your Excellencies. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here and very much looking forward to being able to invite you to visit our beautiful campus in the hopefully not too distant future. Uh, I will be asking questions. Some of the questions I will be asking will be for all of you. Some of the questions will be more individually tailored, but I will be clear about that. But our first question is for all of you. Uh, this morning, the president of the commission, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, laid out her State of the Union with a very ambitious and very challenging agenda ahead. And so my first question is notwithstanding, of course, COVID and the recovery from COVID, which is of course the most urgent problem, what in your mind are the two most important priorities for you know, the EU in the rest of the calendar year? And I will start with uh, Ambassador Haber, please. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me uh, for today's discussion. If you ask me about the two priorities, well, um, I'm in... Uh, <laughs> And that would be very difficult because actually uh, the European Union has a lot on its agenda. Um, setting aside uh, the recovery fund and the multi-annual financial framework, we've gone through um, uh, six months 
of very, very uh, disruptive experiences. And the speech that Ursula von der Leyen gave this morning actually pointed to a number of challenges that we'll have to address in the context uh, uh, of uh, the next generation EU and the recovery fund. The first one is uh, digitization uh, and uh, the second one is climate change. Both issues would have been addressed in any event, but we've seen like in a time warp uh, over the past uh, six months, that both uh, that the European Union, uh, if it is going to be an, a, a geopolitical actor and a trade and economic actor in say five decades, then it will have to address uh, its capacity for innovation and its capacity uh, for um, uh, uh, progress in frontier technologies, uh, in uh, the digital sphere, we have to become a global digital actor. And that's what uh, one of uh, the focuses of her uh, speech was. A second focus will be climate change. Uh, again, we would have addressed it in any event, uh, but the wildfires we see in the United States, but not only here, um, have uh, brought the message home that we have no time to lose. And she actually said, uh, we have to accelerate the attempts. We'll have to... Uh, uh, we'll have to reduce uh, fossil fuel dependency by 55% by uh, 2030. Uh, we'll have to spend uh, uh, on green uh, recovery. Uh, actually, I believe uh, that 37% of our spending uh, in the next generation EU will go to green recovery and green projects, and 30% uh, will be raised uh, by uh, green uh, funds. So both issues are intermeshed uh, with our um, with our recovery uh, and uh, next generation EU plans, and both are interlinked. Uh, uh, with the um, uh, vision of the EU uh, that needs to be a geopolitical actor in our time and age, uh, where the um, uh, uh, balance of the world and the international landscape uh, uh, of geopolitical actors has fundamentally changed. Thank you very much. And uh, I was very struck by the fact that these are very much two transnational challenges as well, which is probably appropriate yes. for the time. Same question for you, Ambassador Chen. What you know, it's there's a lot on the plate for the EU and for member states like like France. So, what would you argue are the two priorities in the short term for the next few months? Thank you, Garrett, and thank you for having me together with my friends uh, Emily and Stavros. Uh, you mentioned Jean Monnet, and uh, I remember that Jean Monnet invented um, the principles of the future European Union and integration when he lived here in Washington, working with the US government uh, to win, uh, uh, to get the victory and, uh, uh, in World War II. And uh, um, I heard he went to walk every day in a Rock Creek Park and uh, his thoughts during those walks uh, were at the origin of the uh, with Schumann plan, which uh, he, uh, where he was uh, also, he took a, a great part. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's really nice to be with you this afternoon. Um, as uh, Emily has said, and the German presidency is, uh, uh, and, uh, is, uh, is really um, very active with all of this. Uh, as we have seen in uh, Ursula von der Leyen's speech this morning, there are a lot of priorities. But if you ask me to quote two of them, uh, uh, on the top of the fight against the virus and the recovery, I would first start with the climate change like Emily, but with the international dimension. The EU must remain in the leadership of this uh, international action. We must absolutely get more ambitious national commitments um, uh, related to the commitments taken in the Paris Agreement. Uh, from the, the, the biggest emitters in particular, we must prepare a successful COP26 next year, and we must uh, absolutely get the carbon neutrality being uh, uh, confirmed as a priority goal with a, a path to get to it. The second priority I would mention would be for Europe, for the EU to draw all consequences, all strategic consequences from the COVID crisis. And I, I will quote one, which is research and uh, um, uh, development in the field of healthcare and uh, 
biology and uh, Ursula von der Leyen, for instance, has proposed uh, the creation of an agency of research and development in these fields. And it, she said, I think that there is something like that in the US already, which means that the US can also inspire what we do in the European Union. So it would be the second example I would quote. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Master Chen, and I, and I can understand uh, Rock Creek Park walks being very restorative, and I know, so <laughs> I understand that. And Ambassador Lambrinidis, again, the same question, but I would be curious about also your reactions as to the priorities for the EU, considering uh, it's a pretty challenging time, to put it mildly. Yes, indeed. I, I would say the first priority and the biggest one, as far as we're concerned internally, uh, is, uh, is to uh, pass and to uh, rapidly implement a recovery plan. Uh, that, in the end of the day, is going to be our biggest point of strength and unity. And I have to say, when it comes to our foreign policy as well, I have seen no evidence of greater recognitions of the EU's solidarity in action and its ability to be a world player than the fact that we made some historic decisions internally uh, about how to fund uh, and how to um, uh, invest in this recovery. Uh, this is going to be a very complex pro process, but it is interesting to note, as, uh, as uh, Emily and Philippe have already done, uh, that um, we have invested in green and invested in digital as our priorities for the growth of the future. We have decided that investing today in the economy of the 20th century after COVID would be the biggest possible mistake we could make as Europeans, that the possibility of an explosion of growth in Europe uh, and consequently of a strong European economy that can be supremely supportive to US recovery as well, because our economies are so interconnected, is going to be a major priority. The second thing I would mention is uh, for, for a priority, because of course I agree with digital and I absolutely agree with uh, the need to invest, is, uh, to need, uh, is the need for Europe to uh, become an even stronger geostrategic player, including in our neighborhood. And the discussions that we are having there, whether it is um, uh, cooperating more together, investing more together, researching more together, producing more together, deploying more together uh, in the field of, of security of defense uh, is uh, something that will give us the gravitas that we need in addition to the soft power, of course, that everyone recognizes we have uh, and uh, will also make us a much more relevant player. So I, I, would, I would focus on those two. Thank you very much, Ambassador Lambrinidis, and I was very much struck about uh, the theme of assertiveness, of greater power and autonomy. It's also that is underlying a lot of these important points. And I also am glad you mentioned this, this notion of the historic decisions. And I would like to ask this question specifically to uh, German Ambassador uh, Emily Haber. You know, the recovery package and the agreement in July took place after a marathon of negotiations over nearly five days. And you know, sometimes there were tense and difficult negotiations. And it was very interesting from the German standpoint to see that there was some changes uh, from previous positions taken by the German government when it comes to the idea of a fiscal, of a sort of a debt union. It seemed like certain important steps were taken. Now, considering next year there will be an election and no longer Angela Merkel, how long lasting do you see those changes? I think do you think these steps have been taken and now have been deeply accepted by the German political establishment? Or is there a possibility that that could be changed or undone, depending on who succeeds Angela Merkel? Well, uh, the decision and the negotiations didn't come out of nowhere. They were preceded uh, by uh, long uh, um, Franco-German uh, discussions. And it's true, we came from different vantage points, as we, by the way, often do. And negotiations uh, among the EU uh, 27 uh, are never uh, a piece of cake, because we all come uh, with our experiences, our histories, uh, uh, our uh, fiscal uh, taboos, and so forth. Uh, so we are maybe pulling into a different direction. But this crisis was truly existential because it hit everybody. Uh, it wasn't uh, a result of, uh, say, economic or fiscal policies. Uh, it wasn't a result of uh, uh, austerity or the lack of it. It, it, was, uh, it was truly um, uh, existential. And I think this message was brought home uh, in, in all European countries very quickly. And the um, 
the recognition percolated down everywhere uh, that if we were not going to um, face and confront this crisis and take courageous measures and perhaps better zone for the moment uh, some of previous orthodoxies, uh, then uh, the, um, the fate of the European Union might really be at stake. And that's the backdrop uh, to the decision we took. It's a one-off uh, decision. Um, some call it a Hamiltonian moment, but it's true to some degree it is for the moment and for this crisis, uh, a mutualization uh, of uh, debts. Uh, the Commission is going to raise money at the markets, it's going to dole out uh, loans uh, uh, um, and uh, grants, uh, but member states will be paying back after a certain uh, period and only according to their share of the budget. So that's a novel concept. Uh, it was designed for this specific crisis and this specific uh, uh, context. Uh, and I think you will see that there is a broad uh, consensus in the German society that this is the way to go ahead. And I may also add, had not uh, in previous years, the German government uh, um, been very determined in defending uh, uh, the principle of non-mutualization of uh, debts and non-bailouts. I do wonder uh, whether the readiness in the German public would have been as prompt uh, and as uh, uh, forthcoming um, to um, throw overboard uh, uh, the pre uh, previous arguments for this specific crisis. So uh, you see, uh, the, the one is linked to the other. The acceptance of the present course is linked uh, uh, to um, a tradition of uh, policy, which now provides legitimacy to what we're doing. Thank you very much, Ambassador Haber. And I really appreciate that you're emphasizing the interdependency between many of these difficult challenges. And I think that's a great bridge for my next question for Ambassador Etienne, which is, as part of these tense negotiations in July was also the thorny question of the rule of law and the insistence on many, and including in the French government, that you know the European Union is a union of values and we cannot continue to provide support to countries that are flouting the rule of law. So how do you thread that difficult needle between the imperatives of keeping cohesion on economic recovery and yet remaining firm on this question of the rule of law and, pre and preventing democratic backsliding? Thank you for the question. It's really a, a, a very important one because uh, it, uh, it reminds you that Europe is not only a, a market, it is a, a political, a cultural project. And if our citizens uh, have the impression that we do not uh, found anymore our common project on the respect of our common values, uh, they, will, uh, they will not uh, trust uh, anymore this project. So um, it, it is a very serious question. You just need to remember the historical context of uh, Greece, then Spain and Portugal becoming members of the European Union, then Central European countries becoming members of the European Union in 2004 and 2007. All those countries came from a, a, a very different uh, historical background and their accession meant also they acceded to a, a community of, value, of, of values, a community of democracies, the respect of the rule of law, uh, including uh, uh, the basic freedoms and uh, non-discriminations, including non-discrimination founded on sexual orientation. All of this is absolutely uh, one of the foundations of uh, the European Union. And it is not a coincidence if we uh, put this also at the core of accession uh, negotiations with future new members. Um, so uh, we have enshrined this in, uh, in the treaties. It's a famous uh, Article 7. Uh, but, uh, and I must stress one very important thing. It's not about one country or about one part of Europe. It is the same for all member states. There is absolutely no uh, difference between uh, different member states uh, according to the date they became member of the EU. The, the rule of law is as important as, uh, and. Uh, the freedoms, the basic freedoms for all of us. But it is not a, the, for one country to uh, accuse one other, or uh, it's, it's really a common, it's a common priority. And I am pleased uh, to, to read that this morning in her speech, uh, uh, President uh, 
uh, von der Leyen announced that by the end of this month, the Commission will adopt its first annual report on the rule of law covering all member states. It's indeed one of the steps we took to go uh, to make progress in this field. But of course, the fact that some basic uh, uh, features of the rule of law are not respected uh, uh, in some places must have consequences. Otherwise, this Article 7 will not be implemented. This is the reason why we discuss very seriously legal and even financial consequences of such situations. And it's absolutely normal, again, it's not based on one country against one other. It's a common good for the European Union and it's a part of our uh, basic construction. Thank you very much, Ambassador Etienne. And I, you know, it's a good also bridge to my next question for Ambassador Lambronidis, which is, you know, last week, the, the fire that broke out in the Moria camp in Greece was a reminder of the issue of migration, even though we are not seeing the numbers that we saw five years ago, is an issue that remains, it remains important, and it's an important test uh, for the values of the EU and for the question of solidarity. I know um, the President of the Commission, von der Leyen, outlined that there will be soon a proposal for a new pact on migration and asylum. How optimistic are you that this new proposal can address some of the long-standing divides and challenges when it comes to that thorny issue? Well, I, I don't want to say I'm optimistic or pessimistic. Uh, I, I think realistically speaking, uh, we are dealing with the migration crisis now, uh, migration issue, rather for quite some time. Uh, and, uh, and we're all increasingly realizing, including through tragedies like the one in Moria, uh, that uh, it, is a, uh, it is an issue that affects us all. Uh, and another area in which uh, uh, showing solidarity can be supremely important. Um, I would say that the emphasis that I expect that we'll be placing is one that combines both better uh, protection of our borders, ensuring uh, that the um, human trafficking networks that are becoming even more profitable than the drug networks, frankly, uh, in the past few years uh, cannot sustain their business models. Uh, one that uh, ensures that the individual rights of asylum seekers uh, are fully protected in the European Union uh, under international law that everyone gets uh, individually examined and determined, uh, but that uh, also if someone is not deemed to have the right to asylum, then they can be returned back uh, to a safe uh, place uh, for them, uh, and that we can support the reintegration of people being returned. Uh, so we take that very seriously. Uh, I think that we will keep putting a major emphasis on saving uh, lives at sea, as we have up to now. Um, I believe that we will um, try to boost European solidarity uh, through uh, also incentives to member states to accept more people um, and more uh, asylum seekers or other uh, refugees or other migrants uh, to their own borders as opposed to in order to alleviate, if you like, the obvious pressure that hits uh, very often uh, the frontier states, uh, you know, the Greeces, the Italys, etc. And I also expect that there will be an even bigger boost in our effort to address the migration, uh, the, the, the causes of migration uh, in Africa, uh, which are immediate neighborhood and around the world. Uh, we've already taken some steps on that, but it's, it's becoming very, very clear uh, that much more work needs to be done. And I think that our support now and effort uh, in Africa and elsewhere to immediately support uh, uh, COVID recovery um, will also have a component of ensuring that at least uh, some of those drivers of migration, uh, the economic destitution, um, uh, can be uh, gradually um, uh, taken out of off the table. Um, human rights violations are always migration uh, drivers. Uh, climate change will probably be the biggest migration driver uh, for us here, for the United States, for everyone else in the years to come. Uh, not addressing it now is uh, sticking one's heads in the sand, uh, assuming that climate change will not have an effect on migration is silly uh, and uh, it has to be uh, done. And of course, uh, conflict, major conflict in our, in our neighborhoods, uh, major conflict in our regions, um, a major uh, asylum uh, and migration drivers. Uh, and, uh, and we will, I hope, uh, be able both alone, if that is what it takes, uh, but also with our allies in the U.S. and with multilateral organizations 
which needs to need to be strengthened and supported, not abandoned during these crises that will be able to address them. So it's going to be holistic. It's going to take a big discussion. It always does. It's not an easy topic in Europe. Um, but I expect that uh, that the very careful work that has been done in the past few years has created a fertile ground for agreement now. Well, thank you very much for emphasizing the, the holistic nature of that challenge and how it very much connects to some of the previous priorities mentioned earlier. I think that's incredibly important. I, I asked the audience to start lining up questions and they have obliged. So I am going to hand it over to my uh, fellow colleague, Professor Michelle Egan, to take over for some audience. You have uh, addressed some of the questions in the in your broad array, but I've picked three that I thought were internal challenges. Um, the first one is uh, from uh, Florian from Germany, and he indicates that the German Economic Ministry has already done a report on the withdrawal bill uh, that the British or the internal market bill that the British have put forward that it violates the Northern Ireland protocol. So the question uh, coming forward as Pelosi and others have also indicated the importance of the Good Friday Agreement, you know, what next from the EU perspective? The second question is somewhat different and that one is from the Washington Post. And it says, how capable is the EU in facing the proliferation of misinformation and disinformation? What sort of impact has the political situation in the United States had on these efforts? And the third question is really about um, the poisoning of Navalny, the longtime critic of Putin. And what can sort of the individual member states, the EU do beyond a verbal criticism, suspend Nord Stream, additional sanctions? These questions are coming from Germany, Chicago, and elsewhere. Thank you. Please feel free to address any or all. Uh, I can jump in on the Brexit one if you want me to, and then uh... Uh, so I would just say there that um, uh, the UK government, uh, uh, different successive UK governments negotiated with the EU. The EU negotiated in full good faith. And the latest uh, government of Boris Johnson um, negotiated and approved the withdrawal agreement uh, that also includes uh, very clear provisions about ensuring that uh, 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 trade between Ireland and Northern Ireland will never have a hard border and will not uh, violate the Good Friday Agreement. Um, this new bill in the uh, in uh, in the UK uh, is, uh, in many areas, uh, a clear violation of the firm commitments uh, in an international treaty, uh, which is the withdrawal agreement that the UK government itself took. So, of course, we are concerned, uh, and uh, the reason we are concerned is because those things that sound very technical to people actually affect real lives. Uh, Ireland. Uh, and the conflict in Ireland, uh, long lasting one is very well known to people from in both sides of the Atlantic. And we are committed to doing everything that we can as a EU to ensure that the Good Friday Agreement uh, is respected in, uh, in, in word and in spirit. And I have to say many, many people, uh, including many members of Congress, uh, as you mentioned here in the US are committed to, for the same uh, thing as well. Uh, so um, we still have uh, days and weeks ahead of us um, but uh, there's absolutely no question that the, that the EU will protect the Good Friday Agreement um, uh, and it would also protect its own single market. Let me explain very quickly what that means. That means that um, fundamentally the biggest strength of the EU when it comes to the economy is that we trashed 28 uh, separate uh, sets of laws and regulations about the economy and the market and we created in its place one single set. That was a huge deregulation experiment and very painful for every one of our member states to come together to what is called the EU key. We have it. And that is a market, the free and open, the biggest free open market in the world now. 440 of the most uh, prosperous, most educated consumers. That is also the best guarantee for US business to continue making more profits in Europe than in anywhere else in the world, more investments and trade with Europe than anywhere else in the world. This is not something that we can jeopardize by having untested uh, goods uh, produced potentially under labor laws and standards uh, or with state aid given by the UK 
that would violate free and fair competition. That's why it's important for us. And that's why it, uh, it, uh, the, the UK um, um, has to comply. Now, um, having said that, just one more comment. Um, Brexit uh, was a very unfortunate moment. We didn't ask for it, uh, but we respected the decision as interpreted by the, by the UK government. Um, at the same time, it was not an existential crisis moment for the European Union, on the contrary. It turns out that the support for the EU among citizens in all 27 remaining member states has gone up, not down, since Brexit. The understanding that the EU is a, a supremely positive force in people's lives, not every single person's, the vast majorities of citizens in the member states, has gone up. That is great for EU strength and unity. And the EU after Brexit will still remain the biggest market for US investment in the world, uh, the biggest market for trading. EU companies will continue to be the biggest investors and the biggest creators of employment in the US itself, by far exceeding anyone else. This relationship, economic, values-based, political, geostrategic, will continue to be for both of us, Americans and Europeans, uh, the most precious one that we have. And we are committed, all of us in Europe, to ensure that this continues to be the case. And I come in on the Navalny question uh, because it implicitly, uh, uh, of course, uh, was directed to Germany. Now, the attempted murder of Navalny is the latest event in a string of events uh, uh, which, um, uh, which elicited uh, European responses, uh, responses from uh, the Skripal case, uh, the annexation of Crimea, uh, the asymmetric war in eastern Ukraine, the catch incident, the Skribal case, MH17, and so forth. That's actually a long story of ruthlessness. Um, a German lab uh, has identified uh, the used nerve agent as one of the uh, Novichok group and uh, independent uh, French and an independent Swedish uh, um, uh, lab have respectively confirmed uh, the findings of the German lab. Now, uh, the, uh, over the weekend, uh, my government uh, has triggered the mechanism under the CWC, uh, uh, which means uh, that the uh, um, organization in uh, The Hague will now uh, have um, uh, certified labs uh, look into the findings uh, and uh, the use of the uh, nerve agent. We have requested several times uh, uh, the Russian government uh, to come forward with an explanation uh, uh, for what had happened and how, uh, but so far we haven't heard anything uh, except for some narratives that for some reason it was Germany that inflicted the nerve agent on uh, um, on uh, 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 Navalny. We are now discussing uh, with European partners how to move ahead. There will not be only uh, verbal uh, responses. Uh, as in the past, uh, when we have adopted, after long discussions, uh, in consensus, uh, uh, sanctions that were putting a price tag on Russian behavior, we're looking uh, in very much in the same vein uh, to do this now and to discuss with Europeans uh, how best to move forward. It's clear to me that there needs to be a European answer. It's clear to me uh, that we have to closely uh, uh, interconnect uh, uh, our response with the American response, because the more coherent uh, we are, uh, the clearer uh, uh, the effect will be. Uh, sanctions are always the strongest form of a diplomatic language. Um, if they're used, uh, they work uh, if you uh, see coherence. And uh, of course, uh, if you uh, use them, uh, I'm not saying in this case sparingly, but a proliferation of sanctions also usually means, uh, um, and if, uh, if used in, in isolation, uh, usually means uh, that there are be, uh, being, uh, that the effectiveness is being weakened. So um, working hand in glove uh, uh, as European Union, as European nations uh, and uh, with, uh, uh, our transatlantic partners will be uh, crucial. You have uh, mentioned uh, uh, Nord Stream. Um, my government had said uh, they're looking at all relevant options, but uh, 
Um, perhaps I may say here that I have always listened with respect uh, to the concerns uh, that had put for, been put forward uh, with respect uh, to Nord Stream. But the discussion here doesn't seem to reflect uh, that Nord Stream actually is a project in which um, over 100 companies uh, from over 12 or around 12 uh, states, uh, nations, uh, are being uh, included. And also, I do, I have never quite understood. Uh, why the import uh, of hydrocarbons uh, carbons in the form of natural gas uh, to Europe is something uh, unacceptable, why the import of hydrocarbons in the form of uh, um, uh, um, Russian um, oil uh, to the United States, which amounts about to the same sum and to the same uh, 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 scale, is something uh, that doesn't even figure in the discussion. It seems to me to point to some sort of Double standard. I will come in now I, with the third question. I have no more choice, so I will uh, <laughs> I will add to what Emily said that the use of chemical uh, uh, substances like Novichok, it is the use of chemical weapons. It's absolutely contrary to an international norm. It's uh, it's a norm that. Um, all parties to the, uh, all members of the Organization for the Prevention of Chemical Weapons have accepted the LPCW, Emily talked about it in, uh, in the Netherlands. So it's, it's absolutely crucial uh, to, uh, to, to take this into account. Uh, it is something which is um, um, uh, really um, very important also for the respect of uh, international uh, legal norms on uh, on, uh, against the use of chemical weapons, which is one of the most important uh, uh, assets uh, uh, since World War I in our international community. Uh, as far as the question on um, interferences in the elections, in, in elections uh, is concerned, um, since it's up to me to give an answer, uh, of course, it is something which the EU as such can discuss uh, through our agencies um, uh, and our uh, um, cooperation in cybersecurity. But of course, it com every, every country, every uh, among our countries, every democracy has uh, its own elections. And it's for each country at one point to decide if you want, if, whether it wants and what it wants to do. As far as France is concerned, as, we, as you might know, we had a, this issue in the, in the campaign in 2017, the last presidential elections. And there was a debate in, uh, in, in my country after what happened. And we have, uh, after long discussions inside our parliament, we have uh, finally gone for a, a certain type of legislation, which uh, uh, allow for, uh, provide for certain uh, protection mechanisms, if uh, it appears that such interferences happen in the course of an electoral campaign. I, I don't want to say that it's, um, it's a, the same sort of uh, remedy which can be applicable in all countries, but of course we can only encourage cooperation uh, among our democracies to see uh, uh, how and uh, what, what, uh, what, what remedies, uh, what best practices we can, uh, we can apply. Thank you. Um, I have the questions are coming in, but I'm going to turn you back to Garrett because he really wants to shift towards transatlantic relations. And then we'll take a few more questions from the chat box as they come in. I can certainly tell you that the largest question coming in is on Belarus. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm um, very happy to be able to shift on also transatlantic relations. Um, it wouldn't have escaped you this morning that, again, in, in the State of the Union, President von der Leyen mentioned a readiness to build a new transatlantic agenda to strengthen the bilateral partnership. And so regardless of who will be inaugurated come January, is there a proactive agenda that you plan to pursue with the US starting in January 2021? And are there issues that you already know you want to tackle regardless of who wins the election? And this time, it's a question for all three of you, but just I'll change the order, and I might ask uh, Ambassador Lambronidis first if he, uh, if he would like to answer that question before Ambassador Etienne and Ambassador Hall. I'm muted, sorry. I, 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 thank you. I would say every single topic in the international agenda is, a, is an important topic in the bilateral agenda for the EU and the US. 
Um, but I would have to say uh, that there is no question that, especially following COVID, uh, a major emphasis that we will place in how, is how it is that we can coordinate the economic recoveries of our economies and also ensuring uh, how it is that we can um, address um, the challenge of economic recovery of other countries around the world as well. Uh, the focus that we are placing as Europeans in uh, creating a world coalition to, uh, to allow for the rapid development of vaccines and, uh, and uh, treatments, um, and the focus that we place on ensuring that many countries in the world, not just the privileged, can have access to them when they come out, that is something that we will be working with our American friends even closer with. And the reason is that, and it connects a little bit with the disinformation question before, is that there may be countries around the world running around like new Mother Teresa's acting like they're really supporting the world. But in fact, if you look at the European Union as member states, what we call the Team Europe approach, about 35 billion euros, more than anyone else in the world, has already been dedicated to supporting countries around the world who are at the front lines of this and the weakest countries to address the crises. We are supporting international organizations such as Gavi and CEPI and the WHO and others who are also at the front lines and we will continue to do so. But a best way, the best way to ensure that the disinformation that somehow we are uh, divided and selfish and all those things to eliminate that is to work together there. I would also say finally, not to take too much time, that we will certainly be working together with the United States uh, to, uh, to address some of the issues that come out with our very complex relations with China. Uh, China has been set by partnership and by bipartisan way in the US as a major priority. And indeed it is one for us as well. Uh, we have determined that, uh, that whereas China is a major world power that we are ready to discuss with, uh, in, uh, in uh, the, a good spirit to address some of the major world challenges, including climate change, it's also an unfair com economic competitor to us, and it's also a systemic rival when it comes to things like governance and values and human rights. Uh, we are taking major steps internally to address those crises, but frankly, again, it's going to be uh, US-EU cooperation also, and also with other countries, Japan and others, that will allow us to change effectively the uh, multilateral trading system to ensure that uh, many of the uh, unfair Chinese practices uh, can also um, be uh, effectively addressed uh, at the WTO. Uh, it is also the best way to address uh, attacks on multilateral institutions um, and the values that they represent, a system that we set up together. That requires us, however, and let me close with this, that both Americans and Europeans stay fully engaged and fully supportive of those organizations. Uh, they are working in many instances supremely effectively and heroically under very difficult circumstances. In other instances, they need some serious reform, uh, but um, um, you know, throwing the baby out with the bathwater, in our view, is the best way to approach this. In fact, this may open up space for those who want to undermine those organizations to take over. Those black holes of power always gets filled in by someone else. Mm -hmm. So a major priority of ours from the next day, no matter who the next administration is, would be to find a way to re-engage constructively together uh, to support the multilateral system. Thank you very much, Ambassador Lambrinidis. Can I ask the same question to you, Ambassador Etienne, in terms of the priorities come January for the transatlantic no, I obviously uh, agree with what uh, Stavros said, and I, I would not repeat it. I will uh, maybe take uh, two two fields in particular. Uh, I think we we should first strive together with the U.S. and with other partners such as Japan, Canada, at uh, improving our coordination to reform the international trade system. And for that, before, before that, we should uh, solve our bilateral EU-US uh, uh, trade disputes, as the European Commission has, has been trying for, for months already to, to do. But we, we really need, including in the context uh, related to China, as, um, as Stavros has just uh, described it, to, to come to more a more 
a, a deeper understanding on how we want to regulate uh, the uh, international trade and economic relations. It's also important to, to, to draw the lessons from the COVID-19 crisis with uh, all this discussion on value chains and on our sovereignty in the medical and pharmaceutical uh, field. Uh, it's, it's really important, industrial subsidies. It's a, it's a future of the world economy. Of course, we also need to make uh, some uh, headway in the field of defense to uh, heed what the United States, whatever its administration says, which is that the Europeans must do more for their own defense. We must continue to advance in this respect. Uh, I think both nationally in our European countries, but also at the level of the European Union. And here we have started to make good progress. And I think that if we go further on this way, it will strengthen both the uh, Atlantic Alliance and the relation, uh, the partnership between the United States United States and the European Union. Thank you, Ambassador Chen. And Ambassador Haber, uh, your thoughts as well on the priorities come January. And again, plenty on the agenda, but what do you think should be the priority? Well, uh, it will not surprise you uh, that uh, I will not uh, differ from what uh, uh, Philip and Stavros uh, have said. Um, let me say this. Uh, um, I've been asked here that when we speak about the European Union as a geopolitical player, does that mean uh, that we see ourselves in some sort of equidistance to the United States and China. And I think nothing could be wronger. Uh, we are tied to the United States as democracies, uh, as countries uh, and uh, organizations that believe uh, in the rule of law, uh, in human dignity, uh, in uh, the liberty of choices and so forth. Uh, and there's no, uh, neither the United States, I believe, uh, and not European countries uh, can look to many other countries uh, in that very same vein. So I think uh, the task ahead, uh, whatever administration will be, uh, um, uh, uh, will, uh, be in place in January is to um, use the uh, uh, enormous uh, uh, challenges that we've seen in this year uh, uh, to join forces again. We are the single most uh, powerful um, uh, and biggest uh, economic relationship in the world. If we actually join forces uh, and redefine our trade relationship, uh, it will certainly have an impact uh, on the European uh, uh, recovery, uh, on the uh, recovery uh, um, uh, on the uh, global, uh, global scale. Also, as Philippe has said, uh, um, the issues where we differ um, in, uh, uh, with respect to global governance, to, global inst to regional or global institutions, to uh, uh, regional or global uh, agreements, that will not walk away. Uh, they will be still there. And it is true uh, that um, uh, institutions and organizations where the United States have walked out uh, have seen um, uh, um, uh, growing uh, assertiveness uh, and growing clout uh, uh, of international actors where we don't see, uh, uh, that we don't want to see is strengthened. So, so to deal with that, uh, to uh, address the flaws they un undoubtedly have, we're not wedded to a status quo uh, and no, uh, uh, no international organization is simply uh, uh, set in stone. We'll, we'll have to address that. Uh, but to do that with a powerful partner like the United States uh, will greatly uh, enhance uh, uh, the affected impact uh, that our cooperation will have. Thank you very much. And I appreciate the, the focus on multilateralism, but also on values, because that leads nicely to my, my next question, which is more for Ambassador Lambrinidis. Uh, of course, there were strong emotional reactions in Europe to Black Lives Matter and to what happened to George Floyd, horrific incidents and afterwards. Strong solidarity, but also an internal look at European societies and what can be done there. And you know, I was very happy to see that last week, uh, all 27 ambassadors met with the Congressional Black Caucus to, to discuss these important themes of the challenge of racism, discrimination, and inequality. I would be curious about what did you take away from that conversation? And what do you think can be a step forward to sort of perpetuate and to really strengthen that cooperation moving forward? Well, I have to say, uh, this is uh, human rights and values are the calling cards of our societies, Americans and Europeans. Uh, so ensuring that we actually do that right uh, is um, fundamentally important for our strength and credibility 
around the world as well. Do not forget, please, even though the, the human rights violators tend to now have much bigger megaphones, that there are millions of people around the world who look up to us, especially us Europeans, knowing how we created the freest and most peaceful union in the world coming out of one of the most devastating and bloodiest wars, look up to us for inspiration coming out of their own conflicts and their own poverty. But that means that challenges that racism that are absolutely present in the European Union as we speak. And uh, in, the Euro in the US discussion, we see uh, that they have come much more to the foreground as well. Um, are issues that we can work extremely closely together, uh, both to raise our voice uh, to ensure that they never get swept out of the carpet and to devise legislation and exchange legislative practices and what it is we can best do to address them. In Europe, we have a legislation, for example, that uh, criminalizes hate speech and incitement to hatred and violence uh, on the basis of someone's race or ethnicity. Uh, this is something that doesn't exist in the US. It may be something that the US would like to consider or not, but being able to discuss those legislations, we also were able to discuss with the Congressional Black Caucus that George Floyd inspired uh, police legislation that, uh, that some members of Congress are, are promoting now, and that also um, could have ideas for us as well. Uh, so that is a very big thing. Um, we also can work much more closely together, Americans and Europeans, however, to address the issue of racism, um, I would say, around the world. Um, racism, xenophobia, discrimination are major topics of discussion um, in, uh, in the United Nations, in the Human Rights Council, in Geneva, uh, in New York. Um, there are um, humongous opportunities for us uh, to continue investing our money and investing our energy in working with countries around the world to ensure that the institutions and the laws are in place to address them. Let me close this answer saying the following. I, I, used to, I, I used to run the EU's human rights foreign policy for a number of years. And whenever I went to countries that violated human rights um, out of political conviction that that's what they should be doing, um, when every other argument ran out, um, they would turn to me and say, in the end of the day, the EU, who are you to talk? look at the migration crisis, look at this issue, look at that member state, look at the other, who are you to talk? And my answer to that always was, you know what? If the litmus test for human rights were perfection, no one is perfect. That doesn't mean that therefore everyone is equally imperfect, but no one is perfect. But is that the litmus test? I submit to you it's not. The litmus test for human rights is, do you have in place in your country the independent institutions that can ensure that a government cannot shove its human rights violations under the carpet? Do you have strong and independent courts? Do you have strong and independent legislatures that do not kowtow or are afraid of their governments or their police? Do you have strong and independent civil society with which you can talk and converse? You may not always agree on a government, but you don't throw in jail, you do not intimidate, you do not arrest on, or, or throw in jail. That's the litmus test. And if you look at it that way, it is supremely important that in addition to fighting racism in our own societies, we support the rule of law as strongly as we can. We support the independence and the strength of those independent institutions because those, again, are a calling card in the rest of the world. Thank you very much, and I'm glad that the discussion was also with the Congressional Black Caucus about concrete steps and legislation and exchanging of best practices that is incredibly important. Uh, Ambassador Etienne, on, on a different subject, but France has been quite vocal on the question of digital tax, and there's been a long-standing work on trying to reach an agreement through the OCD with the 140 nations more or less involved. Uh, it's not been an easy subject with the United States. Now, if if there is no OECD agreement by the end of the year, is the way forward national digital tax? Is the way forward an EU digital tax? How do you sort of see the, the road ahead on that uh, challenging and all important economic question? 
Well, thank you for the question. Indeed, you have not chosen the most, uh, the easiest uh, part. Well, the easy, why does he get the easy questions? Why does he get the easy questions that we get but, the tough ones? But uh, you, 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 you're right to say there is a European dimension, because when we, when we have, um, um, when our parliament has uh, voted this uh, legislation, uh, it was actually very much uh, on the on the model of the 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 idea which had been discussed and uh, negotiated at the European level. And I think, again, the new European Commission has uh, also uh, signaled that this uh, remains very much a, a European a, a EU um, um, a priority. Now, look, the, the idea on, my, on, on the side of my country has never been to impose national legislations. We, or we always wanted to get to an international regulation. And you mentioned the OECD negotiations. They have two pillars. One is about the evolution of tax policies worldwide, because the tax regimes we have in, all, in place in, in all our countries are based on the physical presence of companies. With the digi digital economy, it is completely different. And it leads to very unfair distribution of taxes among taxpayers and it is not sustainable how can i convince a sme or a citizen in france or even a bigger company that they have to pay big taxes while other companies which make big profits on the internet do not pay anything so everybody agrees it is unsustainable but everybody agrees too both governments and uh, business that we rather we would rather have a unique uh, world taxation regime. It is really the priority and it remains our priority. We have the OECD negotiations. We have um, set out to ourselves, both the US and France, when we discussed this, to try to settle this dispute, um, the um, a timetable where we would have results in the OECD by the end of the year. I am aware that it is not that easy, probably the second pillar is doing maybe more progress more rapidly than the first. But anyway, we need to have international agreements uh, as soon as possible in place. Otherwise, the only alternatives are uh, regional, like the EU, or indeed national um, regulations. So let's hope that we will make still progress in the OECD very, very quickly. Thank you, Ambassador Etienne. Uh, Ambassador Harper, of course, back in the summer, the announcement of President Trump withdrawing troops from Germany with little consultation was not necessarily, you know, welcome development amongst allies. And this is on top of longstanding di disputes about burden sharing and the infamous 2% metric. I'm just wondering though, considering how well Germany and other European countries fared in terms of the early management of COVID and the, the, inf the investment in the health infrastructure and in terms of building up resilience, does that vindicate the argument that we need to have a more expansive definition of what counts as security spending? Well, um, the uh, listen, changes in military posture happens all the time. They're completely legitimate. They're usually informed uh, by uh, strategic uh, considerations or by changes of uh, threats or uh, the environment, etc. Uh, in this specific case, uh, uh, or synergies and efficiencies. Uh, in this specific case, uh, it, it is true uh, that um, some of the arguments had a punitive ring to them uh, um, and overlooked the fact uh, that in terms of burden sharing, we're not at 1%, we are at nearly 1.6%. Uh, and uh, American troops are in Germany not to protect Germany, uh, they're there to uh, protect transatlantic security and to project American power. I think of Wiesbaden or Stuttgart, uh, where American operations in 56 uh, and 51 uh, countries respectively uh, are being coordinated. Uh, so this is very much about uh, transatlantic security and American security interests as well. And this did not really transpire, uh, um, uh, transpire in the uh, discussion nor uh, is it uh, the complexity and also the richness of the transatlantic uh, 
uh, of our uh, German-American transatlantic relationship uh, and the areas where we closely cooperate, not even in the uh, security and military con uh, context. Uh, our, um, our efforts in, uh, um, in the Baltics uh, were not factored in. The missions uh, that we have in Africa or Afghanistan uh, were neither here nor there. So it was a very eclectic, uh, um, uh, it was a very eclectic uh, focus uh, uh, that eclipsed uh, the larger picture, which should have been factored, uh, uh, should be factored in uh, when we look at the transatlantic relationship and what we are to one another security-wise. We have a very vigorous q and I'm wondering if I could ask you to oblige just for a, a final rapid round of questions for five minutes. Would that be appropriate? I, I know how busy you are, but we also have had a busy audience. So is that OK to a final round if I bring in my colleague, Professor Egan? Thank you. Many of the questions you have already addressed, but two have come up most consistently. And one has been many European states have denounced the election results in Belarus. And what role do the EU and member states intend to play? What would you do if there's further crackdowns? And how are you cooperating with the United States on this? So Belarus is a big concern for the audience. And the second concern, I hope, is not just for France, but the French have taken a clear stance on an emboldened Turkey in the eastern Mediterranean by standing with Cyprus and Greece. And Germany has, according to the uh, um, question, has been comparatively reticent. So has the EU reached a consensus on how to handle the situation? So what kind of cooperation do you have with the United States, given what's happening in the eastern Mediterranean? So it's both a question for both Turkey and Belarus, if you can answer either. Thank you. Maybe, maybe I can come in if you want uh, to start uh, answering the questions. First, of course, we discussed both issues, Belarus and uh, Eastern Mediterranean with, uh, with the United States. Uh, on Belarus, we, we are strongly in favor of uh, deciding sanctions against, against those in Belarus who have uh, acted, uh, uh, for, who have participated in a crackdown on the population and uh, 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 who have frauded the elections. We want to, to get to a, a dialogue inside the, the Belarus between the, uh, the Be Belarusian people. And for this, we, we, we strongly favor the intervention of the OSCE, uh, which is uh, there to act under such circumstances. On Eastern Mediterranean, I don't feel there is such a big difference, uh, not, not at all. Uh, there is not even uh, any difference between France and Germany in, in our, for me, uh, uh, Emily will, uh, will say what she thinks, but I, I think we, we, we have the same goals and we have also the same um, uh, solidarity with two other member states of the European Union, which are Greece and Turkey. We, we just, and there, was, uh, there were discussions. And Chancellor Merkel and President uh, Macron uh, on this uh, many times, but we, we we just express this maybe in different ways, and I think that uh, uh, we have uh, complementary actions in the, in this respect. So we 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 really need to to the, I think the both of us and the whole of the European Union, frankly, is interested to have a good relation with Turkey. We want to uh, reestablish a dialogue in good faith with with this. Uh, uh, very important partner. On the other hand, we, we must express uh, uh, this solidarity with uh, two member states of the EU and act accordingly. I would sum up, uh, since it is late, our, our, our position uh, in this way. Uh, I would agree with that. Uh, we share the same objectives. Uh, uh, Greece and Cyprus uh, are uh, uh, partners uh, in the European Union and they deserve security, uh, they deserve uh, solidarity. Uh, Turkey uh, is an important partner uh, outside of the European Union, which plays uh, a role that needs to be addressed. Uh, and we're seeking uh, a, a peaceful solution uh, at, at the moment, and uh, that's where we are in full, of, uh, full agreement. Uh, as Philippe has pointed out, uh, sometimes uh, um, uh, sometimes um, complementarity uh, reinforces uh, the clarity of the intended objective. Uh, on Belarus, I would just add uh, that uh, here we have a case uh, that is clearly not uh, on geopolitics. Uh, um, 
the people in Belarus uh, do not look uh, towards Brussels or Washington uh, or elsewhere. Uh, they think about themselves. They uh, want to make their own choices. It's about their future. And it's hugely important uh, that we keep uh, um, uh, the development in this framework because framing it differently uh, might, alter, uh, might alter the calculus uh, of, uh, uh, say, Russia. So we've been completely clear in saying the elections have been fraudulent. Uh, uh, Belarusians deserve uh, to make their own decisions on how they wish to live and uh, uh, how uh, um, uh, they want their government uh, and what they want their government uh, uh, to be. Uh, and we will be uh, strongly supportive of that, not least uh, within the framework of the OECE. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. I'll have my colleague come back and finish up and conclude. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was an absolutely wonderful discussion. I really appreciate all three of you, Ambassador Haber, Ambassador Etienne, and Ambassador Lambrinidis, Lambrinidis from taking the time and a busy schedule to discuss all these important subjects, both in Europe and in the Transatlantic Partnership. Much to follow in the upcoming month. Warm thanks, of course, to all the people who made this event possible, the people working at the embassies and the delegation and our colleague Kate Aaron. It takes a lot of work to make these events happen, and we're very thankful. And a thankful, of course, to the audience for participating and for wonderful questions. We look forward to the day again that we are able to welcome you on our campus and not for this format. But otherwise, keep an eye out for other events from our partners, the JM in the US series, and for the events of the Transatlantic Policy Center. And I am biased, but I am also a big fan of the debating competition organized by the EU delegation, the Schumann Challenge is a wonderful opportunity for undergraduate students to engage with policymakers on real concrete problems of the day. And none other than Ambassador Lambrinidis will be one of the judges, I believe, in the final. So and a great opportunity to engage with him in that way. Thank you all. Thank you for your attention and stay, stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you.